we've been wanting to do this program for a while, and we're thrilled you're with us, and we're thrilled we've got a full house. And I am going to turn the microphone over to you because they want to hear you, not me. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. We've been wanting to do this program for a while, and we're thrilled you're with us, and we're thrilled we've got a full house. And I am going to turn the microphone over to you because they want to hear you, not me. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this is really was, was kind of scripted as, as a lecture, but I, rather than it being a lecture, it's going to be an open format, so I'm just going to run through uh, a few brief, brief slides, and if there's questions or comments or anything along the way, we'll have Q&A at the end as well, so please <clears throat> feel free. Here, I'd just like to, this is a little bio of all of us here. Um, we're sitting in the front row with me are, are my colleagues, are starting on the right here is Joe Siri. He's been with, with me in the sports finance group at MUFG for a number of years and recently transferred over to our private placement group, which I'll talk about more. It's one of the key products in sports finance. <clears throat> uh, sitting next to Joe is Peter Sender. Peter has been with us, uh, oh, about a year, year plus now, and he's a, an associate who does all the heavy lifting in terms of the analysis and how sports transactions are working. And, and lastly, there's James Izzo here. He's also a colleague of mine and helps on the marketing side as we uh, go forward. So just wanted to talk briefly about the sports landscape and talk about how, how big it is in terms of the North American market. Um, <clears throat> there is, uh, we cover in terms of the, 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 the coverage model, we cover the five um, leagues here in North America, including MLS, which is getting a lot more traction <clears throat> and a lot more growth in terms of increased number of of teams. Uh, the, uh, in, in, in the in the US, uh, we operate the bank on, on a vertical structure, which basically means that the sports finance group is part of the tech, media, telecom, and sports group. So we have cross knowledge within the bank of all the various players around the ecosystem of sports. And that's very important because sports now is very much driven by media. Live content, sports, is number one. Local news is number two. So what we're seeing now, the evolution of the distribution of sports, which you could basically sit back and say it's a live content business, unscripted, DVD proof. In other words, you watch the game live. You have to see it live because if you don't, then you'll hear about the score and so forth. So it's the number one product that's desirable, both by traditional linear TV and also now by streaming services, or what's generally referred to as over the top. <clears throat> that's the Amazon Primes, the Apple TVs, and all the streaming products out there. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the United States, uh, 10 cities are very much um, very, very big in terms of sports, and they're all listed there. The New York Tri-State area, which is a little bit of an expansion, has the most, because we included the Buffalo market too, a couple of franchises up there. But the New York area has the most teams, uh, 13 in total. Part of our coverage, in addition to the big five leagues, is we cover the European soccer leagues as well. And oh, across the pond, there are five as well. Of course, there's in England, the Premier League, <clears throat> In Italy, Serie A. <clears throat> in uh, Spain, La Liga. France, Ligue 1. And also the Bundesliga uh, League in, 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 in Germany. And the reason I mention that is because there has been an increased attention of US owners going across the pond to make acquisitions. Of course, the Glazer family, which owns Tampa Bay, years ago was the first one to venture across and purchase Man City. Uh, excuse me, Manchester United. And subsequent to that, there's been at least a, a eight or 10 or possibly more entities that now both control franchises domestically and now have taken the US model across the pond. And I'll get more into that when we mean the US model and what does that mean, but it's principally around venue and venue development. <clears throat> So <clears throat> the sports market <clears throat> is pretty big, and we looked at it from we look at it from both the participatory and the spectator side, and it's it's uh, 
Of the five major North American leagues, obviously the NFL is the largest. The NFL has aspirations to go from 16 billion in total revenue estimated for 2022 to 25 billion. And how are they really going to get there? It's an interesting question. But if you sit back and think about the media rights and what's happened there, sometimes they are able to double sell Thursday night football. In other words, it's on over the air, it's also being streamed. You can watch it two ways, which is two revenue streams. And the NFL is still the most watched sport of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the five uh, listed here. When we talk about the ownership of professional sports team, that's what's been really interesting over the last 15 to 20 years. Of course, it's, it's evolved. And when we say that, it's evolved principally from a mom and pop perspective. Some, some family or some uh, uh, individual has controlled uh, a, a team or a franchise for a number of years. Usually the evolution of that is, is to investment entities or successful private equity individuals and so forth that form partnerships that now take it to the next level. And they basically bring in a lot of professional management and exploit the product in more, many different ways through social media and so forth, which increases the fan attention, which increases um, usually the pay of the payroll at the end of the day, which makes the team more competitive and becomes sort of a, a revolving successful door on that basis. But <clears throat> those same owners now are taking the model and also going across the pond as previously mentioned. So the last point I want to make on this slide is um, the fact is there's a lot of attention right now being played to how um, sports is being distributed and how people are not looking at linear TV. There's a lot of cord cutters or cord nevers in the market and so forth. But when it comes to sports, sports is really what's still holding together the linear TV model. <clears throat> because 70% of U.S. adults watch sports on linear TV. And it's interesting when you look down the spectrum then to Gen Z and Millennials, of course, then it drops off. Only 39%, 41% of, those, uh, of that class of, of, of fans, <clears> that the, they use, primarily use streaming to watch sports and so forth. So it's evolving. But the linear TV model is still being held together, very much so, by traditional, uh, by, 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 by sports. So, we often get asked, you know, why do sports teams need money? They have tickets revenue, they have venue revenue, they have TV revenue, and so forth. Well, why do they need, why do they need money from the banks uh, or, or, or the private placement market? And usually the answer is, because not all of them make money every year. <clears throat> And the biggest expense of a team is player payroll. And the teams domestically have gotten a lot more sophisticated over the years, where generally, when you look at the five major leagues, generally where it's evolved to through various negotiations is that of the top line of the sports team, generally about you're doing okay if you spend no more than 50% of that top line revenue on player payroll. <clears throat> if you tend to go above that, then you're going to run into usually a financial issue, and sometimes the banks are there to assist for that. So, but <clears throat> most successful teams, setting aside the NFL for a moment, which is usually dependent on what type of venue they have, most teams generally, if they break even on a PL basis every year, that's a good year. They do end up <clears throat> sometimes getting deep into their seasons and so forth, and there is usually player trades, or there's one more player that we need. And generally, that sort of bumps up the payroll a little bit, and then sometimes they're not successful and going deep into the season. And that's generally how a team generally sometimes loses money every year. However, <clears throat> what generally happens is that once a, uh, uh, an owner 
understands the market and gets a little bit more disciplined and is able to run a break-even enterprise, if that owner or control person controls the franchise for at least five, seven, or ten years, they will make a very successful exit. Because what's happened is, from the media side, sports content is just becoming more and more desirable. <clears throat> Apple TV just made some news within the last week or ten days. They entered into a ten-year uh, licensing agreement with MLS <clears throat> for their for their uh, uh, streaming product. Amazon, of course, is is very much in in, in in the market. Apple TV also has now Friday night Friday night baseball. So when we think about sports, we think about okay, what is it that makes it valuable? And clearly, the live content and the number of distributors of the live content that are interested in that product for strategic reasons want it going forward. Um, <clears throat> In terms of how we look, and this may get a little bit granular, so whatever, but I'll just carry on. But uh, sports is uh, very conservatively uh, structured from, from the standpoint of, of banks and, and private placement investors. And when I say that, it generally means that the banks are, are willing to lend to the franchises, they're willing to lend to, to the venues, we're willing to lend to sometimes the regional sports networks as well. But we do it on a, um, an all-asset secured basis. In other words, we take a pledge of all their collateral. And uh, sometimes the leagues themselves, and I'll get more into how the governance of the leagues works and so forth, sometimes the leagues uh, request lines of credit from the banks. And you kind of say to yourself, well, why is that necessary? The leagues are just there as sort of like a governance body and so forth. But the leagues sometimes act Brought as a lender of last resort. There was a situation with the, with the, with the Los Angeles Dodgers a number of years ago. The, the owner at that point, the court, was basically spending too much on payroll. He ran into a liquidity issue. And the, the league had to step in and uh, solve the liquidity problem and so forth. But it was a successful resolution at the end of the day because the league were there, provided liquidity, and uh, the situation uh, resolved itself in terms of change of ownership and some, some new investors coming to the table. So the leagues also arrange uh, credit facilities, which the banks provide, and um, that's a, 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 a key product of, 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 of banking sports franchise, the sports industry. <clears throat> Where we've seen a good number of activity, a good number of, is, is basically in, on the venue side. And the venues are basically um, different entities or different borrowers at the end of the day. So you have sports team over here, <clears throat> then you have venue co over here, and generally you have ownership up here. So ownership has an equal share or controls both entities, but the venue co basically has dedicated cash flows uh, itself. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, usually venue, venue has a naming rights transaction, uh, like City Field, uh, there's sponsorship within the venue, there's concessions, there's premium product. When we say premium product, what does that mean? Well, if you've been to any recent developed venue, you are basically have probably been either in a suite or a club. <clears throat> and those uh, areas within uh, the ticket prices within those products uh, at the venue are at a premium. And anything above the average ticket price, above that, the premium portion of that belongs to the venue. Because the venue was developed with the premium product and the venue earns that back through the premium revenue. So those dedicated cash flows are available for financing venues. And sometimes venues are privately financed, and sometimes there's an element of a public-private partnership. And with that, I'd just like to talk about one transaction briefly that we at MUFG were involved in, uh, two transactions very quickly. One was the Texas Rangers. <clears throat> now, the Texas Rangers basically had a relatively new venue in, in Arlington. And um, <clears throat> they reached a, 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 a uh, a point where it was getting very difficult to, um, even at night during the summer months, 
in terms of conducting um, baseball games because the heat and humidity in Texas is, is, is quite onerous. So they were really looking for a, a solution. <clears throat> so the city of Arlington came forward and said, well, we don't, really don't want to lose you as a tenant or a, uh, you know, as part of our key um, uh, um, development here in, in Arlington. So this is what we'll do. We'll, we're able to basically provide $500 million of municipal support. <clears throat> and how did that happen? Basically, the city of Arlington sold basically muni bonds. Those muni bonds were then serviced by what they call a hot tax. A hot tax is basically a hotel occupancy tax and a car rental tax. So <clears throat> the theory is that whenever you travel to Arlington, you're renting a car, renting a hotel, when you check out, you get your bill, you see all these in invoices, you see all these additional taxes. That's generally um, how these projects are sort of supported. So the long and the short of it, the Texas Rangers got $500 million, <clears throat> which was able to help them with their $1.2 billion retractable roof stadium. Uh, and it was a big success. And the balance of the financing, $600 million, was done at the bank market. Three banks came to the table, and New York being one of them, for one third each that we were involved in was for the Atlanta Braves. They left the city of Atlanta, went, uh, <clears throat> went up north to Cobb County, and Cobb County did, in, in essence, the same thing to draw them there. But the distinction there, and they did this to a degree with the Texas Rangers, the distinction there, the Braves also, and the ownership of the Braves, Liberty Media, used the team as an anchor for a multifaceted development around the arena. And when I say that, what did they do? They built some commercial office space, they built a hotel, they also had some residential units. And it's interesting, when you think about real estate and real estate development, when you have a mixed use project, and you are having a condo for sale, or you're looking to lease up the commercial project, on average, in a mixed-use project with amenities, you are able to market that product at a 25% premium to a standalone sort of condo here, you know, to standalone. So the teams act as an anchor, and the anchor sort of supports the mixed-use development, and Liberty Media has been brilliant in terms of exploiting both the value of the team and of course they were successful on the pitch for winning the World Series, but they were also very successful in terms of uh, monetizing the real estate around the venue, which is very critical. Another transaction that we were involved in very quickly is the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the new venue, or the reconstruction of the venue for the Seattle Kraken. And I'd like to ask my colleague Peter to come, come out for a brief set of moment and talk about that, Peter. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Peter Sender. I'm an associate in the Portfolio Management Group, which is responsible for digging into the financials and guiding the credit application through the approval process. We were jointly a ranger uh, uh, for the financing of the new arena in Seattle, which is commercially known as Fine Pledge Arena, and which is also home to the Seattle Kraken NHL franchise. Uh, the construction project was a renovation of Key Arena in downtown Seattle that began as a $700 million project, uh, but ultimately turned into a $1.2 billion project because of cost overruns surrounding the stabilization of the uh, existing roof since it was considered a historical city asset. Revenues generated by a venue are typically split between the anchor tenant, in this case the cracking, uh, and the venue. We focus on the re revenues that are specific to the venue, as Jerry mentioned, um, and which are typically separated into two main categories. Sponsorships, sponsorships and premium seating are contractual revenues that typically have medium to long-term tenors, so think three to 10 years, uh, which provide for guaranteed cash flows to help repay our debt. In the case of Seattle, about 50% of revenues are contractual, with the balance being event or attendance driven, and these are revenues like rent for each event held at the arena, fees on each ticket sold at these events and concessions. We evaluate various factors like market demographics and the strength of ownership uh, to get comfortable with these projected revenues. And in this case, uh, for Seattle, it's, the strength of ownership was really key here because we believe it would help route additional events uh, through the arena um, in addition to the guaranteed NHL events that would come through. The $600 million facility we provided to the arena is known as a delayed or multi-drill term loan. 
This allows the arena to borrow the amount required for each phase of the construction project based on funding needs at that time uh, versus borrowing the full amount up front, which saves the borrower on interest expense over the life of the loan. Um, in the case of Seattle, the multi-draw term loan was left in place until construction was nearly wrapped up and the arena was about to open before it was eventually taken out or refinanced in the private placement market, uh, which our colleague Joe is going to come up and talk about a bit more next. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so I guess before I dive into the, um, the refinancing of the Seattle transaction, I figured I'd just do a brief overview on what the private placement market is. So. When I say private placements, I'm referring to securities issued under the Section 482 exemption of the Securities Act of 1933. The private placement market totaled an estimated $124 billion in 2021, with around 29% of volume in non-USD. So it's a pretty diverse market with issuers from various industries. Um, the market is predominantly investment grade, though there's a large amount of growth coming from um, non-investment grade issuers. And uh, investors are looking for well-structured transactions with companies similar to bank uh, lenders and have a buy and hold approach, which is different from your typical bond buyer. So sports issuers in the private placement market include um, leagues, teams, venues, and other structured transactions such as CTLs or lease monetizations. So um, just to get back to the Seattle transaction, <clears throat> So as Peter said, just before the arena uh, reached substantial completion, the bank financing was refinanced in the private placement market. So investors at that point looked for a significant amount of contractual income. So as Peter said, when they're doing the bank financing, it's all projected. Um, when the private placement investors come in, it's actually sold. So you wait um, typically up until the arena is ready to open or really when there's a substantial amount of contractual revenue that you're able to monetize. So in this case, it was right before the arena opened. Um, the issuer is looking to maximize the amount of debt, as you can imagine. So um, the strategy was to issue the most amount of debt possible while still maintaining an investment grade rating, which they were able to do and take out the full amount of debt that they um, incurred for construction. Um, it was a very successful transaction. The issuer was able to achieve a long-term 25-year final, fully amortizing mortgage-style bond with an attractive coupon. Um, this transaction was completed as a club transaction, which means the agents, which I mean, she was one of two, um, put together a small group of investors that are um, very interested in the space that could write larger checks. So. It's easier for the issuer because there's less investors to manage, and it's also easier for investors because they can um, get a larger allocation on their commitment, which is always good for them. So ultimately, um, seven investors circled this transaction, which is a relatively small group, and despite only going out to the small group, the transaction was two times oversubscribed. So very successful transaction for both the bank as agent and also for the issuer. Uh, pass it back to Jerry. And as you can see, I have a great team around me, so uh, they, they do all the heavy lifting, but uh, it's, always, it's always nice to, to be around to do successful transactions. So. I'd just like to, uh, <clears throat> to go on and, and uh, uh, talk about briefly um, in terms of how the leagues operate and so forth, because there's a distinction really a little bit from the NFL versus the other the other entities here. Um, the NFL is, is the only entity that basically every game is sort of a national game, and uh, the uh, the other uh, the other sports also have a uh, a local component to it and so forth. Right? So, <clears throat> just a few brief comments. And just some of, some of this is repetitive, and so in some of the aspects of what we do, but. Uh, I think it's important to re-emphasize that, uh, as Joe mentioned, we have a prior placement product, we also have a bank product. And, and, and what you see in terms of sports is you really don't see a sports entity going out to the public markets and then the financials get, get sort of uh, out there. Uh, so uh, the sports entities, the sports owners like to say within the banks, it's a private market, nothing gets, gets published in terms of financials and so forth. 
So of the, uh, <clears throat> the facilities that we do is, is, is clearly what I mentioned in point number one, you know, we provide credit facilities for the legal office. We also uh, sometimes migrate over and, and finance the regional sports network, e even though that's an evolving market with court cutting and court nevers. Nonetheless, um, the ones that we, we focus on are generally affiliates of the teams, like, uh, like the Yes Network or, or SNY here in New York and so forth. Um, and also, in terms of team financing, uh, this is interesting because the, the leagues are basically in the business of, the league offices are basically in the business of protecting the franchisees. And when I say that, they want to be sure that the franchisees um, don't over, over lever themselves. Uh, they, want to, they also have various um, uh, salary caps, hard caps, soft caps in terms of player payroll in place. Um, so from the standpoint of providing financing, it usually has to require a consent or no objection letter from the legal office before the financing is closed. It's just one of the ways of, of protecting um, the, the franchises uh, at the end of the day from you know, getting into financial issues and so forth. Um, venue financing, we briefly talked about that. We gave three examples, as we just said, you know, Atlanta, Texas Rangers, and of course the Seattle uh, project as well. I just wanted to briefly talk uh, a little bit more about the elements of public and private financing, uh, the equipment's called the PPP uh, partnership structure, because it's critical. Um, <clears throat> um, some, some transactions uh, that we've been around have been 100% privately financed. And, um, but the ones that are really, really successful have an element of public, public support to them. And uh, that's becoming much more difficult to do going forward because it's generally um, municipalities don't want to be in a position of being perceived as supporting you know, private enterprise uh, and so forth. Um, but when it is available, it just makes the transaction that much more uh, e easy. I mean, there are two entities in the baseball space, the Oakland A's and, and, and the Tampa Bay uh, Rays that have been for, for years trying to get the local, local municipalities to uh, to help them with, with the construction of the new venue. And you know, now there's uh, projected rumors that the Oakland A's may be moving to Las Vegas, for example. So, but that's generally what happens in terms of playing one location off against the next and so on. Um, so it's um, <clears throat> something that we pay close attention to, but it's, it's certainly an element of, of the venue space. And lastly, on this page, we, we, we also provide financing around the, uh, you know, to, to uh, various scoreboards, elevators, uh, other equipment, uh, FF&E, uh, the stadium related projects as well. So what I mentioned earlier that, you know, we are part of a, uh, of a technology, media, telecom, sort of vertical and so forth. We just put together this little confusing sort of circular structure here because, um, the sports industry kind of crosses over into all of these entities in one way or another. And uh, <clears throat> for example, on the right hand side, broadcasters and RSNs and the, the Yes Network. I mean, the Yes Network is a very interesting example of a successful enterprise that's probably about 20 years old now. But I remember when George Steinbrenner was still with us and he basically wanted to. Um, to start the network. He was very much a, a, a believer in, in of, of course, the Yankees. He also uh, you know, had the rights agreement to the Brooklyn Nets. And for a brief period of time, George had an investment in the New Jersey Devils. So he thought he could have summer content and two winter contents to, have, to, to provide a lot of programming <clears throat> uh, for you know, a startup um, a regional sports network. But one thing about George that people don't really realize is that it's not that easy to start a network because you need, obviously, you have the airtime that's live and um, around the sports event, but there's a lot of show programming that needs to be developed. And George is very brilliant because he went back to his team who was starting up the network and said, well, what about those radio show, talk show hosts, that those, those things on the radio? And he goes, they all look at it, yes. But why can't you broadcast that? That was George's idea. Now you can watch uh, whatever Mike and Mike, whatever it is, in terms of turn on the Yes Network, or you see the Michael K show, and so forth. So <clears throat> that was all within you know his his idea in terms of providing show the programming and and, uh, and 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 controlling some of the value that the Yankees and the Nets and, and, and that that have developed in, in terms of the, of the Yes Network. <clears throat> Next slide. 
So, um, lastly, I mean, this is somewhat competitive. We talked about bank loans and what is what we do, capital markets, what we do in the private placement market. Sometimes teams and leagues have um, have have have. Um, Foreign currencies, for example, uh, in the hockey space, the NHL has a deal with Rogers Communication, and that's in um, that's in uh, Canadian dollars. There's, there's hedging uh, around that, or exchange exchange products that we provide uh, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, trust accounts is basically around uh, various structures around the venue where uh, reserve accounts need to be. Be set up for uh, for interest reserves and so forth. We do that as well. Of course, excess cash deposits, cash management services help the teams manage cash flows and so forth. And also, too, in terms of the ownership of teams, there is a uh, uh, a great number of, uh, of wealthy individuals and private banking opportunities sometimes arise from that. Lastly, in terms of um, advisory. Um, that's not something that we do as a bank, but certainly there are other entities that provide advisory services in terms of sales. If a franchise comes up for sale, both from a control position or from an LP minority sale, um, there are entities that, 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 that provide advisory services in terms of brokering those transactions and so forth. So the last, the last thing I just want to talk about is, is just in terms of how the leagues operate and in terms of the, uh, the structure of the leagues and, and so on. So first thing I want to mention is in the NFL space, in the NFL, um, 32 owners, they're just that, they're individuals. You can't have a C-Corp or partnership on an NFL entity. Uh, the other entities, you can have C-Corps or, or so forth. But the NFL is still traditional and you still need to have at least the control person person who makes the decisions, that's at the board of governors meetings and so forth, that person needs to at least own 30% of the franchise. Um, and you know, so that's a unique structure. Uh, and it's a generally all a franchise system. So in other words, uh, you know, you're granted a, a franchise right to operate within a certain territory and so forth. Um, the commissioner, which is nominated by the owners, so it's somewhat incestuous, but nonetheless, there is a commissioner who basically has discretionary powers and you know is there for dispute resolution and so forth. And uh, and it's also the internal disciplinary system for, for the players and so forth. But the commissioner is elected by the owners, and it's kind of like it's, as I said, somewhat incestuous, but it's there, it's there for a purpose and, and a good reason. And lastly, this gets back to the point of having a successful franchise and a successful uh, financial position. The collective bargaining agreements that are, that are entered into with the players have evolved, as I said previously, to basically around 50% of the revenues are, 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 are paid out to, to the players in terms of player compensation. Uh, <clears throat> some of the leagues have, have caps, salary caps. And some of them are hard caps, like the NFL is a hard cap. That means a certain percentage of the revenue of the league can be spent on player payroll. So even if you sign a player and you decide to give that player a signing bonus, that signing bonus has to be amortized over the length of the, that contract. And so uh, it's really, really a hard cap, which makes the NFL you know, the most successful of, of the major sports. And um, the other entities like the NBA, they have a what's called generally known as a soft cap. If you're an owner, you're Joe Sully, you control the Brooklyn Nets, you want to win, you can sign as many players as you want. Um, the only issue is if you keep doing that repetitively season by season, you are basically going to be subject to a luxury tax. And that luxury tax, the more times you go above the cap, the higher that tax is. And so what happens? So he has to write that check, that check, then they get distributed the other 29 teams. Of course, the idea is, from the league perspective, they don't want to limit it, but they want to try to maintain some sort of parity at the end of the day. Um, uh, MLB does not have a salary cap, um, but they have a luxury tax. So again, same situation if the owner wants to go and get that one or two more player in, in late July or August to try to win, to go forward, they can certainly do that up until the trade deadline. But if they go above a defined level, then it's the same thing. They have to basically be subject to a tax, pay to the league, the league then distributes that back out to the other 29 owners. 
and so forth. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the lead governance and the way the salary arrangements work, and also to the leagues kind of limit the amount of indebtedness that a franchise can, can, can have. Um, financing uh, the leagues and, and the teams is, is a, uh, from a banking perspective, a, uh, a, you know, what we, we see as very, very conservative structure and frankly a very good business. So with that, I'll just open it up to any questions. Sir. So Jerry, you mentioned the five major sports that uh, you guys are involved in and how big TV is in terms of these sports. Uh, golf has a different model, I guess, because there's no teams. Is that the issue? Or does golf get involved? With, do you guys get involved in golf at all? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we, we try to call on the PGA and so forth. Uh, and, uh, um, they haven't taken our call yet. Frankly, I think they, they, they have too much liquidity or, or too much money, or maybe that's going to change recently with, that might change. with the soybeans and so forth. But uh, no, that's a great question. We, we, we've tried, and you know, obviously, USTA, same thing. You know, they recently did that menu. Uh, they closed the roof in terms of flushing. You know, we tried to call on them for that as well. Um, one thing we did venture into was um, that we, we bank, uh, again, this is part of being the vertical of Tech Media Telecom. We banked Liberty Media, John Malone. About four years ago, John purchased Formula One. And so we're involved in that, that transaction. But that's a unique structure because Formula One is the top tier of, of racing. And it's become very, very successful, even stateside now. With Las Vegas coming next year, we had Miami this year, you had Austin, Texas, you have three races stateside now, which traditionally has been a European business. And I just read recently that he purchased that for, I think, $4 billion, it's now for $12 billion. So, um, and they recently renewed their US TV rights. They went from $5 million to $75 million um, for the US ESPN uh, TV rights on that. So. We, we look at other businesses around the sports sports industry. Um, it's tough to find good ones. We find a lot of interesting, you know, second tier football leagues that are trying to be formed and so forth, um, which are sometimes difficult to bank. So, good question. Um, are, are the stadiums or the venues owned by REITs or, or by the actual teams themselves? The team structure. It's uh, if it's privately financed. If it's privately financed, there's no public or partnership to it. Generally, that is owned by the team, or I should say, controlled. You know, through an owner use agreement, which is generally long term. You know, like 30 plus years with options and so forth. And in terms of municipalities, like you mentioned, the Texas Rangers, the city of Arlington technically owns the stadium, but the Rangers control it through the lease. And what that means also too is. They are responsible for the operations, the ownership, the maintenance of it as well. So, yeah, great question. I was just thinking, it's such a heavy lift. I mean, if you just manage it, those venues, mm -hmm. I can see a lot of financial pressure on the team, especially as you mentioned, with the 50% of the, of the cost of goods is the, is the team. Mm -hmm. That's where I would think that the, the team uh, salaries would be a cost of goods out of the expense. Right. Um, but I can see that has a lot of, a lot of pressure. Yeah, no, you know, the Yankees and the Mets, for example, what happened there, the, the Yankees and the, the uh, Yankee Stadium and City Field are technically owned by the city of New York. <clears throat> However, it was financed through a, a structure which basically puts the team under a lease. <clears throat> so every year, the Yankees have to pay a lease payment, and then they also have to operate the venue. So um, that's a pretty substantial number at the end. Actually I, I, actually, I think it's public and so forth in terms of the, the, the financing document. So, in essence, yeah, the city of New York created this tax-free zone, which, which enabled them to sell municipal debt that was tax-free, so they got a little bit of break on the interest. But in essence, the Yankees and the Mets are actually paying for the venue over time. It's actually a pilot structure, a payment in lieu of taxes. Sir? Uh, how do you like, accurately measure viewership or interaction across verticals, specifically like from cable to streaming to specifically like social media, how do you able to gauge interaction via those platforms? And how does that apply to the overall value of like a lead franchise or 
individual entity in terms of financing or as media rights folks, specifically like measuring how Gen Z plays a role, feel like their interaction on social media, how do you measure what these are growing more quickly than other than popularity? How do you accurately measure that or the challenges associated with that? Yeah, no, actually, I mean, that's a great, great question, but that's not something that we get that granular on at, at the financing level, but at the team level, that's a, that's a critical aspect of in terms of, you know, getting the consumer data to try to understand, you know, where, where the, uh, where the interest is, so to speak. And social media has become, you know, so big in, in everyone's lives and so on. So, um, but it's not something that we get that granular on. We're, generally, what happens is, <clears throat> if they're successful in those platforms, then what we're going to see is increased attention, increased attendance, and increased um, Nielsen ratings in terms of the broadcast. That's what, that's what you'll see it come through. And then when that happens, then advertising revenue goes up and so forth. So it cascades in that direction. And I think what's happening too a little bit, <clears throat> social media is being used as a way to get direct to consumer customer data. Because as I said, the linear TV industry is evolving and sort of losing customers or not gaining young, young customers and so forth. So social media is being used as a way to monitor who's interested and then figuring out a way to have them evolve back in sort of some sort of streaming service, you know, for the content. Yeah. Sir? Of the $60 billion that NFL is generating today in revenue, mm -hmm. how does that break out pie-wise? What, what portion of the $60 billion goes, comes from where? Is it all <clears throat> media and TV or? Um, I would say, yeah, in general, um, 50 percent, give or take, is the end of the day. Um, Who else? Take, sorry. Who else contributes to that system? <clears throat> yeah. And then, then in terms of it, it's 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 um, the venues as well. You know, think of AT&T Stadium, for example. You know, 100, 110,000 capacity and so forth. Uh, the suites, uh, uh, the sponsorships, um, uh, ticket revenue. Um, the ticket um, revenue goes to the NFL. They got a piece of the NFL. The NFL well, gets a well, piece. That number, sixteen billion, is the total total that the, 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 the teams generate, thirty-two teams generate, as well as the leagues generate, and so forth. I got you. Um, it's so, not all the NFL. It's, it, it's, it's not all to the league. No, it's not all. No, no it's, it, it's an aggregate number. Thank you very much. Thank you.